Amen. First, I want to say good morning. Good morning. Yeah, thank God for everybody that's here today. Uh, just want to say a couple of things before I get into the message. Uh, one, I want to just thank God for my wife. Uh, you know, she's she's been a a, a rock. And, and, and for me, I mean, a lot of times people just don't know how much she does for me and for this church. And uh, I just want to give her 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 flowers while I can. Amen. But I want to thank God for her. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I thank God for all of you. I mean, we're in a state of flux, transition, but God's gonna work some things out for us. Thank God for Dr. Wilcox. Yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, it's funny because sometimes you ask God to give you, uh, you know, uh, a, a friend. And sometimes God will give you friends that are closer than a brother. And I thank God for my brother, Brother Warren Wilcox. Amen. All right, let's get into the Word. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you praise and thanksgiving for all that you do for us. Thank you, Lord. Even on our worst day, we know we're blessed. Yeah. And I thank God for that. I thank God for your your virtue, your healing virtue, your mercy and your grace. And I ask that you would use me today and speak speak through your servant to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 It's, it's kind of funny. I, you know, last night I was sitting down taking notes and writing some things down. And I just kind of had a feeling what God wanted me to share. And you know how the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit will say, no, nah, not there. Let's go this way. And sometimes he does it five minutes before the sermon. So, that's where we're at today. So turn me to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, chapter 16. 1 Samuel, chapter 16. We may bounce a little bit around, but I want to talk about King Saul. King Saul. King Saul. 1 Samuel, chapter 16, starting in verse 1. It says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears, he will kill me. But the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I name to you. Now I pop over to verse 7. It says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And there's so many rich examples in these chapters about Saul and David, but I'm just going to try and stay on one plane of thought today. You know, a lot of times when we uh, come to know Jesus, our Lord, our Lord and Savior, we come uh, to a saving knowledge of, 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 of God, um, sometimes the, the initial months and years of salvation can be confusing and it can be a little bit uh, disorienting because one of the things we have to learn after we get saved is that it's not by might nor by power, but by His Spirit. Anything you do for God requires the power of God. Anything you do for God requires His insight, knowledge, His direction. And that's hard because as human beings, we have a tendency to always try and do things our way. And we're all guilty of that. But one of the things that, that I've learned from studying the Old Testament is some of the harsh examples in the Old Testament uh, were placed there to show us how not to do things. And if you look at the book of Judges prior to 1 uh, uh, Samuel and 2 Samuel, one of the things that was a characteristic of the book of Judges was God used the most imperfect people to get the job done. I mean, you look at uh, Samson. Samson was a drunk and a whoremonger. You got Gideon. He was a coward. And then you got Jephthah. He was born of a prostitute. And then you got Deborah. She was a woman. Now, I'm not saying that in a, in, a, uh, in a weak fashion, but that's how women were treated back then. Nobody expected a woman to lead anything in the Old Testament. So all of the people in the book of Judges had flaws. But God used them. 
How was he able to use them? Because of one thing, the anointing. The Bible says it's the anointing that destroys or breaks the yoke. And what yoke are we talking about? The yoke of bondage, the yoke of uh, sin, uh, the yoke of uh, uh, the enemy keeping you uh, in, in need of deliverance. The anointing breaks those yokes. But it takes a servant that will allow God to use him or her to allow the anointing to have his way in your life. And a lot of times we resist. We resist when God's trying to do it and we want to do it our way. I remember years ago when I was in high school, I played baseball. And, 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 and I got to start the season. And I was all hyped up and excited. I got up to bat and I got my first hit. You know, playing varsity baseball. You know, and I'm standing on first base. And then back then, I thought I was Superman. I thought I could, I could do everything. So I'm standing on first base, and you know, you're always supposed to wait for the manager or the coach to give you the signal to steal, whatever that signal is. Well, he didn't give me the signal to steal, but I'm looking at second base, and I'm like, I can steal second base. And I just put my head down and started running. And the, and the coach is going like this. I, I didn't know. But I, I'm going to do his thing, you know. And I made a mistake. And I, instead of looking at the bag, I looked at the catcher. And while I'm looking at the catcher, the catcher threw me out. And I went back to the, you know, bench all dejected. Needless to say, I didn't play the rest of the game. <laughs> but the coach said one thing to me. He said, you got thrown out because you took your eyes off second base. And a lot of times, spiritually, when you take your eyes off of the will of God, when you take your eyes off of his perfect will, and you try and do it your way, you're going to get thrown out. Amen. And that's what happened to me, and that's what happens to us a lot of times, spiritually. We, the, 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 the object of our attention should be this book. Yeah. The Word of God, and, and so many Christians take the Word of God for granted. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, we'll we'll brag about how saved and spirit filled we are, and read the Bible one day a week, mm -hmm. and then we wonder why we don't hear a word from God, or we'll we'll, we'll call that number on TV to try and get a word from some preacher if you got seven hundred fifty dollars, and I need to get a word, so I'm gonna call this one or that one. No, you got sixty six books yeah. and the Holy Spirit. That's all you need. You ain't got to pay nobody for a direction of word from God. You got the Holy Ghost, you got the word of God. But if you don't read the word of God, then you're not going to know because the Holy Spirit is trying to give you what's in the word of God to interpret it for you, to use, give, give it to you, and we're not reading it. So who do we have to blame but ourselves? So let's go back to Saul. King Saul started out pretty good. But the problem with King Saul was two things. One, King Saul was a result of the children of Israel whining and complaining to God about, we don't want these judges anymore. We want a king like the other nations. Well, God was their king, but they were too blind and carnal to see that God was the king. You, you, you go back and read the book of Judges. Every victory Israel ever had was a result of some miraculous thing that God did. You know, Samson is as vile a person as Samson was. It says Samson killed more Philistines in his death than he did in his entire life. Jephthah was the son of a harlot, yet he delivered Israel. You know, Gideon was a coward, yet God used him to deliver Israel. And go, it goes on. And the reason why God does it like this, you know, the Bible talks about how God chooses the foolish things to confound the wise. You know, you want, you want, a, you want a good example, look in the mirror. I look in the mirror and I say, God, how did you call me? I'm a hot mess. God specializes in hot messes. Yeah. All right? Because when, we, when God chooses a hot mess like us, who gets the glory? Him. Yeah. You know, and, you know, and it's sort of like the rich young ruler. He said, God, you know, I've obeyed the commandments. i got all this money. Come on, let me follow you. And Jesus spotted one weakness and you like one thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And said he went away sad. Because his confidence was in his, himself and in his riches and not in Jesus Christ. Your confidence has to be in God. Yes. You will not succeed unless your total trust and confidence is in God. Yes. Stop depending on your willpower and your in instincts and your charisma. That ain't working against the devil. Yes. It's the anointing. And Saul had a chance. Yes. He had a chance to be a good king. Now physically, Saul was an imposing figure. The Bible says that he was head and shoulders above everyone in Israel. Head and shoulders. That means he was a pretty tall brother. Right? 
So he tall, you know, yeah, he probably looked like a movie star, uh, strapping young man. Samuel anointed him. So what was the problem? The problem was Saul was dependent upon himself and not the anointing. How do you know that, Elder Stevens? I'll give you a couple examples. God told Saul to go fight the Philistines. But before you go fight, you had to offer up a sacrifice. Who offers up the sacrifice? Not the king, it's the priest. So he, he's standing there pacing back and forth, and, 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 and I got to go to combat, you know, and I got to offer him the sacrifice. And Samuel ain't here. He didn't wait for Samuel, he decided to do it himself. And Samuel got there and said, what are you doing? I'm offering up the sacrifice. Oh, you're the priest now? See, that shows you where Saul's mind was. He wasn't thinking about God. Now, was he religious? Yes, because he realized that uh, there was a need for a sacrifice. But a lot of us are like that. We're religious, but we're not spirit-led. Your religious habits or, 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 or instincts don't take the place of the anointing. There's a lot of times when the anointing will lead you to do something that goes against religion. Say, all the Stevens, well, how, how can that be? Well, let's look at the example that Jesus said. You know, remember that time when Jesus got rebuked by the Pharisees? Because they said, your, your disciples are eating with unwashed hands. You know, and Jesus reminded them, it's not what goes in you that defiles you, but what comes out. Yeah. And there was another example when Jesus healed somebody on the Sabbath day. Well, they went off on Jesus about that. And Jesus said, well, if your ox is in a ditch on the Sabbath day, when you get it out, yeah, and that's why Jesus said uh, at the same time when he was teaching and stuff, he said that, that, that um, oh, Lord help me. Anyway, I'll get back to it. That, oh, your traditions have made the word of God of no effect. And a lot of times that's what happens to us. God wants us to be led by him. Not your, not your religious ideologies. Not your religious dogma. He wants us to be led by him. Because there's going to be times in your life when the Holy Spirit is going to tell you to do something that goes against tradition. You know, like the time I got in trouble when I was a deacon for showing up to church almost an hour late. But I was late because I was helping change the old lady's tire. What was more important? You know the answer to that. You know, got an 80-year-old lady on the side of the road. Oh, I'm going to help this lady change her tire. But see, that's where we, 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 we miss it sometimes. We miss it. And that's what the problem with Saul was. Saul didn't understand that these rituals weren't just about him, you know, doing something to perform in front of the people. It was about victory. Victory came because they offered up sacrifice first to God. So they would know that the victory is not in you, Saul, but it's in God. If you look back throughout the Bible, whenever Israel had great victories in combat, it wasn't because the Israelites fought so good. It was because God went before them. Yeah. The Ark of the Covenant went before them. The priests went before them. The tribe of Judah went before them. And by the time they got to the front lines, a lot of times the enemy was already dead. And a lot of our problems could be solved if we would just learn how to be spirit-led. Stop trying to figure it out on your own. God wants to give us the victory. We have the victory whether we realize it or not. But you can't walk in victory if you're walking in the flesh. You can't walk in victory if you're walking in your own ideals. You can't walk in victory if, you, if you're led by your feelings. A lot, a lot of times our feelings get us in trouble. You know, we, we walk by faith, not by sight, not by feelings. You know, there's a hit song that came out last year about this, being in your feelings. All of y'all saw the, uh, uh, whatever his name is. You know, yeah, a lot of times we're in our feelings. Get out of your feelings and get in the Word. Get out of your feelings and get on your knees. Because your feelings will fool you. Saul was like that. Let's, let's, I'm going to talk about Saul a little bit more. Okay, so Saul gets another opportunity to redeem himself. God told Saul, I want you to go to Amalek. And I want you to kill the Amalekites. He didn't stutter when he said it. He said, the Amalekites, not some of them. Wipe them all out. So what did he do? He kept the sheep and he spared the king. And, and he spared some others too. Because later on down the road, Israel had problems with the Amalekites. So evidently, he let a lot of Amalekites live. So then, you know, you know Samuel's like, what did you do? I, you know, Saul's up there, yeah, I, I killed the Amalekites. And Samuel's like, what's this bleeding I hear in my ears? What's this, this sheep I hear? So then Saul gets religious and he goes, well, let's, we, we, we say the, the sheep for a sacrifice. No. 
The sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite spirit. That's what God wants. He wants honesty. He wants truth. Yeah. He, see, you can't halfway obey God. You know, halfway obeying God is like not obeying God at all. It's like when I was a little kid, my mom told me to wash the dishes and mop the floor. And I washed the dishes and didn't mop the floor. Yeah, what was going to happen to me when she got home? Uh -oh. <laughs> I might as well not done nothing. Because <laughs> she's going to chase me with that mop for not mopping the floor. Yeah. So we need to understand, God, saints, God wants to use us. Saul had the same anointing that David had. Remember this. It wasn't that, you know, David was that much better a, a fighter than Saul or, you know, more capable. It was about the anointing. Right. You see, Elder Stevens, how do you know that? Because when Goliath showed up on the other side of the valley and he started taunting Israel, you know, send me a man. Send me somebody. And if he beats me, we'll serve you. But if, if I beat him, you got to serve us. Saul, head and shoulders above all the men in Israel, was on the other side of the valley. His knees were shaking. Yeah. But he was anointed. What are you doing with your anointing? Are you allowing God to use you? Or are you standing on the sidelines with your knees shaking? And that's God. You know, I, I say this all the time. I get in trouble. I don't care. When I tell people the primary reason God fills us with the Holy Spirit is so we can win souls. Yeah. So we can preach the good news. So we can go forth and cast out devil, lay hands on the sick. It ain't just to come in here and, and, and run around the church. That's one of the reasons why we ain't seen no change in our community. Because we got the Holy Ghost locked up in a room. Amen. Yeah. But God needs the gifts of the Spirit in the street, in the hospital, in the prison. You know, I, I, I saw... Um, uh, Bro Wilcox, you know, he sent the, the, the message out that he's at, at the, that uh, Wagner, right? Yes. With the young man. And you know what? We need more people to do that kind of stuff. Yes. You know, it cracks me up when I see Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons riding up and down the street on bicycles, giving out false religion to people on the street in Camden. But we got saints that know the word of God locked up in buildings. Yes. There's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with that. We're anointed for a purpose. For a purpose. Not just to sit, and, sit down and say I'm saved, sanctified, and filled. Because right. if you really were saved, sanctified, and filled, you would realize I got to do something or allow God to do something in me with this anointing he gave me. Yes. All right. And in verse 7 says, but, but the Lord said the same, well, do not look at his outward appearance of physical stature. See, God could care less about your background, what you look like, whether you're skinny or fat, whether you're young or old, because the Bible proves that. God used the 80-year-old man to deliver Israel. God used a woman, a judge, to lead Israel. So it, it doesn't matter what your sex is, it doesn't matter you know, how old you are, God can use you. Because it's not the flesh that wins the battle. It's the anointing. That's why God could care less, you know, about any of those circumstantial, you know, things. He doesn't matter to God. You know, the fact that David was a 14-year-old boy didn't matter. Because David had a testimony already. As a teenager, he killed a lion and a bear. Yeah. So we need to understand something. God wants to use us. So many times, and I'm guilty of it too. You know, when I was, when I was before I got sick with the sarcoidosis, I was a pretty healthy guy. You know, I used to lift weights. I could bench press 350 pounds, run five miles a day. I was a black belt in karate. And I used to love all the air. You know, now, getting out of bed in the morning is a struggle. I walk to the car and I'm tired. But you know what? The anointing yes. is what God uses to get the job done. He don't care about my muscles. He don't care if I can kick a board and break it. You know, he don't care if I can, that stuff don't matter. He didn't call me because I had that ability. In fact, one of the first things God did when I got, got it said in my calling was put that karate stuff down. Yeah, God, God, God doesn't call us because we're so grand and great. You know, if God was running the NBA, he wouldn't have drafted LeBron James. He'd have drafted somebody like you know Tiny Archibald, you know uh, Spud Webb, because God, God can take that little thing and do great things with it. And I think we need to understand that, you know, Saul is a classic example of a carnal Christian. A Christian in name only. A Christian that he looked apart. You know, he looked strong. He looked powerful. But in, the, in reality, Saul was a horrible, weak person. And what makes us weak 
is when we don't realize our weakness. Now, Saul would have gone a lot further with God if he was honest with God and said maybe, okay, God, I'm a little afraid right now. I need some help. But he didn't do that, but he played the part. God's tired of us playing the part of a Christian. He wants us to be Christians. He wants, he don't want us to look strong. He wants us to depend on him for strength. Paul said it best when he said, his strength is made perfect in weakness. Yeah, a lot of times the, the, real, the real challenge for us is admitting we need help. That's the challenge for us. You know, God doesn't want, you know, how many times you heard people say this? And I, I just heard it recently too. You know, you know, somebody dies or somebody is going through a tragedy or trauma. And the first thing a Christian sees, he's like, be strong. Is that really the best advice you can give somebody that's going through? No. Really the best advice is call on the Lord. Amen. You know, cry out to God. Amen. Yeah, because you know what? In your humanness, you're not going to be strong. You know, you're not going to be strong because we're human. But if you look in the Bible, the people that God used the greatest were the ones that were in the weakest conditions. Look at Joseph. He was framed for, for rape, locked in prison. Family put him there. You know, but God elevated Joseph to sit on the right hand of the Pharaoh. Why? Because Joseph kept his focus on God. Keep your focus on God, saints. Stop worrying about how it's going to get done. Just know it's going to get done. You can't worry about how. That's part of our problem. How you going to do it, Lord? It don't matter how he does it. You know? And, and I've seen it in my life. I've seen situations in my life where people that I least expected God sent to help me. Yeah. I remember when my wife and I moved from Edgewater Park to Browns Mills. The pe we, you know, I was just, just coming out of Correction Office Academy. I wasn't making a lot of money. And, uh, you know, we just bought a house. But, you know, you know, when you buy a house, you take every penny you got. Yes. So I, I didn't have a whole lot of money. But you know what? One of my drunk friends that I was stationed with at McGuire gave me a truck to use and a trailer. And one of my other friends came to help me move. The people I expected to help me, none of them showed up. But God, when you cry out to help for help for God, he's going to send it. Don't worry about how it looks. Yeah. Now, here's Saul, Goliath, and then his armor bearer, David. Or really, his, his heart player, because that's what David was there for, to help get them demons out of him. Amen. Right? So, David steps up and says, send me, I'll go face the, the giant. So, what does Saul do? Gives him all his armor. Now, if he's head and shoulders above everyone in Israel, how do you think that armor looked on David? Yeah. That's like, you know, me taking my size 13 shoes and giving them to Elijah. So, David said, no, I can't use these. I, I can't use these. And he picked up a sling. Now, I want you to think about something. In, in, in your mind's eye, do you think a slingshot could really take down a giant? No, of course not. No. And, and I'm sure Goliath had an armor too. But the anointing. It was the anointing that guided that rock. It wasn't David's accuracy. It wasn't David's muscles. It was the anointing. Yeah. And when the anointing gets into the equation, victory's there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Saints of God, if you're saved, raise your hand. All right? Well, you know what? You're anointed. Yeah. And a lot of people try to, you know, act like, oh, no, you ain't really anointed. You know, you didn't roll on the floor in little bubbles. Listen to me. If you're born again, you're anointed. You can't be born again unless the Holy Spirit is inside of you. Get that through your head. And because you're anointed, because the Holy Spirit is inside of you, you can talk to God like a, like a child talks to his father, and you can ask God for help when you need it. And through that power and that anointing, God will help you. Whether it's through the fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, however he comes, the help is there. I'm going to tell you something. Another reason why a lot of times we don't realize the power of the anointing is because even though we're New Covenant saints, sometimes we act like we're still in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit resided in a building right. or a tent. He ain't there no more. He's in you. Yeah. You, know, I get, you know, a lot of times people think I'm trying to be deep. I'm not trying to be deep. I'm trying to help people understand the Word of God. Right. When people come into church and they go, oh, I feel the presence of God. <laughs> oh, come by here, Lord. He's in you. He's in you. 
We still singing slave songs. You were set free. He's in you. And you know what? I'm just as guilty. A lot of times when you get in trouble, I'm guilty too. We forget that God is in you. He ain't above you. He ain't around the corner. He's sitting on a throne in heaven, you know, uh, waiting for you to mess up when he got a big stick so he can smack you upside the head with it. He's in you. Yeah. Greater is he that's in you than he that's where? In the world. Who's in the world? The devil. Yes. So why are we worried about the devil? Shouldn't be. Greater is he that's in you. Now, one of the reasons why we don't realize that, like Saul didn't realize he had the anointing, is because, like the Bible says, submit yourself therefore to God, resist the devil, he'll... Please. David understood that, even though it, it, it was written thousands of years later. David understood that. He understood that because when David got on the scene and Goliath was over there, David said, who is that uncircumcised Philistine that defies the armies of God? First of all, David recognized that this, this Philistine was uncircumcised, meaning he didn't have a relationship with God. Amen. And he said, he defying the armies of God. How you gonna fight God? That's what David was basically saying. You, you can't beat God. But Saul did not realize that. He didn't realize that. A lot of times saints, we don't realize that. Stop acting like God's a million miles away. Right. When you wake up in the morning, good morning, God. Yeah, because he's right there with you. Oh, yes. Yeah, he, he ain't leaving either. See, a lot of times we base our situation on the, on the distance that God, God has from us. You know, and we're all guilty of it. Me too, so I ain't trying to act deep. Now, I'll never forget one time, I was still in the Air Force, and I had to drive my, uh, my military vehicle uh, over the bridge to go to Will's Eye Hospital. And they had to give me an, uh, an injection in my eye. And so after the, guy, the doctor gave me the injection, you know, the doctor says, look, Mr. Stevens, I'm be blunt with you. You know, it doesn't look good with your eyes the way they're deteriorating because of the sarcoidosis. And he basically told me that it wouldn't be long before he, I could possibly be blind, right? I'll never forget, when I drove across the bridge, back to McGuire Air Force Base, I cried all the way across the bridge. And all I could think about was, what would my life be like if I went blind? But you know what? When I got on the other side of the bridge, got back to the base, got in my car, and drove home, the Lord told me to read Psalm 13. And I read Psalm 13, and that's my favorite psalm to this day. I read Psalm 13, and David was upset with God because of his circumstances. And David said, how long will you hide your face from me, God, forever? And that's how I was feeling. But then I kept reading. When I got to the last verse, it said, but I will trust in your salvation. That's what we got to do, saints. Trust in the salvation of God. You're not saved just to avoid hell. You're saved so God can use you. Yeah. And so with that in mind, all I could think about was, well, how well could God use me if I was totally blind? And as soon as I said that, the Lord said, I can use you anyway. Right. It doesn't matter if you're totally blind or not. God can use you. Yeah. In fact, it's funny because right after that, I met a guy that was totally blind. He's a chaplain. In fact, I, I hired him when at Ancora. Yeah. Totally blind. He's working at University of Penn now. Don't tell me God can't use you. It doesn't matter what your situation is. Stop looking at your situation and look at God. And that was Saul's problem. You know, he worried about the sacrifice and, and, and not willing to wait on Samuel. You know, hey, if, if Samuel didn't show up until the next day, I'd have waited. Because I knew the Philistines outnumbered the Jews 10 to 1. So why am I going to try and go into battle against an enemy that I couldn't beat? Unless God was there. Amen. All right, almost finished. Look at uh, verse 22. Then Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Please let David stand before me, for he has found favor in my sight. I should have read that before. There was something about David that Saul liked. And he wanted David around. And of course, he played the music and the demons got dispatched and everything. One of the things about God is, when God has a call on your life, people are going to know it. People are going to know that you're special. And it's not because you dress a certain way or smile a certain way, but that's what the anointing does. The anointing separates. You know, the Bible, we talk about sanctification. Sanctification simply means that you're set apart for God's use. Yeah. And, and I don't care. You know, that's why I tell people all the time. When you, when you get saved, you don't belong to yourself anymore. Free will doesn't apply to save people because you were bought with a price. 
David was anointed. Now, did David make a lot of mistakes? Yes, he did. In fact, some of the sins that David did were more grievous than what Saul did. The difference was David had a relationship with God. David sought the direction of God. It was David that said, you know, that one thing about his eyes, that will I seek after, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. David loved God. Now, did his flesh get the best of him? Yeah. But David always came back because David realized, without God, I'm nothing. That's why Saul couldn't recover. Because even when Saul messed up, all he thought about was losing the throne. He should have been worrying about losing his salvation. Because when David messed up with Bathsheba, what did David say? Lord, please don't take your spirit from me. Because David realized the importance of his relationship with God. We have to realize the importance of our relationship with God. Yeah, nothing's more important than your relationship with God. Not, not job, you know, not income, nothing's more important than your relationship with God. Because ultimately it's going to be God that's going to help you and guide you through whatever situation you're going through. And that's where Saul messed up. Saul had the anointing. Saul could have beat Goliath. Now, he might not have beat Goliath the way David did. But because he had the anointing, he had the victory. But he got scared. God didn't give us the spirit of fear. But of love, power, and a sound mind. Stop being scared. This, if this is something God's laying on your heart to do, then do it. And don't worry about how. Don't worry about how it's going to happen. Who's going to, don't worry who's going to help me. Don't worry about that. Because a lot of times, God's not going to send somebody to help you. Because a lot of times what happens is, then, then somebody else will get the credit. Yeah, God, God is a jealous God. God wants all the credit. Now, this sounds kind of weird. God jealous? Why? No, it's not that God is imperfect. It's that God wants the people around to realize it was him. Yeah. That's why a lot of times, you know, my wife can tell you some of these stories. On the mission field, you see more miracles a lot of times on the mission field than you do in the States. And the reason why is because God's trying to show these people that he's real. He's trying to show people that I'm all powerful. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. Especially in these countries where people practice witchcraft and things of that nature. Yeah, God wants to show up and show out to set people free. Yeah, and he needs us to be a part of the plan. Yeah, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. God's got your back. Right. Yeah. David stepped up to the plate, knocked it out the park. Saul, bigger, stronger than David, didn't get it done. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Everybody, everybody stand. Thank you, Jesus.